I'm Maya Forsatter. I've had so many hugs this weekend. <laughs> I really, really hope this vaccine's working because I've had so many hugs. Um, <laughs> if anyone doesn't know, I lost my job for saying that sex is real. I took my employer to tribunal and I lost and I unlocked the JK Rowling badge um, and I leveled up and then I won. Um, and <laughs> and I sort of, I did realize how important it was, but I'm realizing it. I've had so many conversations with people over this weekend and obviously over the last few months saying, you know, I'm a teacher. This means I can raise safeguarding issues. Or I'm a civil servant. This means I can talk about the Equality Act. Um, you know, I'm a policewoman and I can talk about the issues as they, as they relate to policing. And, um, you know, it's all people saying, I can do my job and we should be able to do our jobs. I mean, the, it's, it's ridiculous that we can't, but I can feel the ripples spreading out from, from what I did. Um, and it's been brilliant to, to meet so many people who've been touched by it. But obviously, some people haven't got the memo yet. Um, uh, most of the universities, well, they've got the memo, but they, they're not quite sure what to do with it. Um, the trade unions, uh, all of the 850 organisations that are still signed up to the Stonewall Champions Scheme, uh, in, which includes the government legal department, you know, the, the, the lawyers in government who, are supposed, who wrote the Equality Act are paying Stonewall to tell them what to do. It's, it's yeah, I mean, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, have, who are in charge of um, enforcing and communicating the Equality Act, have left Stonewall. And I think we're already starting to look back at that, and it seems like, you know, people used to be able to smoke on buses. And now we think, you know, can you imagine smoking on a bus? Can you imagine a government department that's, that wrote the law or whose job is to tell people what the law is, paying Stonewall to, to mark their homework? Um, they are leaving, so the Ministry of Justice has left, um, Ofcom has left. <laughs> Ofsted has left, um, the BBC has left, I think the BBC has left. But there's still hundreds more that we need to convince them that um, discriminating against women discriminating against anybody who says that sex is real is not part of equality and diversity. Um, and so I, I'm going back to tribunal in March for the rest of my case, which is still really important because it's, we need to have these rights on paper, but we also need to show that when an employer uh, abuses these rights, we can, get, we can get justice and we can get remedy. So I'm going back in March. to do that and I've also co-founded an organisation Sex Matters which is campaigning for clarity on sex in law and policy in the UK so that nobody loses their job <laughs> for saying that sex is real. So I'm going to do a kind of panel discussion and I had this, I talked to Lisa Marie and she said who do you want on your panel and I started making a long list and it was a very very long list so um, I want to show you the video so you can see the long list.
yeah, I, I couldn't bring J.K. Rowling. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, Lisa Marie. Um, I'm, <laughs> it's, on, it's on YouTube. I've watched it so many times. And I made it. There was like three days in between when they tell you what your judgment is because the lawyers get it before and you're not allowed to tell anyone. And your lawyers ring you up and they like read you the riot act over the phone before they tell you what's happened. And then, then they say, okay, we're going to send it to you. And then they send it to me. And then my husband walked in and I'm just sitting there like just grinning. And I, he's like, what happened? And I'm like, <laughs> For three days, and you can't say anything. People are just like, don't call me. I can't talk to anybody, because it would be so obvious. So anyway, I made that video while, while I was in that kind of purda. <laughs> and it's about the chain of people that give us courage to speak. And so um, I think we all have different chains. Mine was, um, it was Jenny Murray. Um, it was, it was um, uh, Posey Parker and Venice Allen. And, and, then it was, and then it was Rosa Friedman because she's sort of in my sector. And I think, you know, when, it's, when you hear somebody in your sector speaking up, that gives you a particular kind of courage and a particular kind of boost to speak. So I wanted to um, bring back some of the women to talk about um, what their chains were and what gave them the courage to speak and what's given them the courage to keep going and what they think about, um, you know, how we make this chain reaction uh, go nuclear, really. Um, so, but before I do that, there are um, three other women that I want to talk about. Um, so one is uh, Joe Phoenix, who's here somewhere. Um, <laughs> So, Professor, there she is in yellow. Pre Professor Joe Phoenix at the Open University. I, I lost my job and it was quite painful, but you know, it's like losing a tooth, you know, it's a big shock and once it's over, it's kind of like, what do I do with this hole? But um, if you don't lose your job, if you stay in your job and you're being harassed and, um, you know, humiliated every day, I think that's so much harder. Um, and Jo Phoenix has stayed in the Open University and she's been treated awfully. And she's, it, she's announced today that she's taken them to tribunal. She's launched Crowdfunder. <laughs> so if, if you haven't seen it, it's um, bit.ly slash prof phoenix is a short way to find it. Um, and as we were sitting back there, I think she's, she's hit her um, initial target. How much are you up to? Yeah. But, um, lawyers are expensive and uh, I think she needs about at least 50 if not 80 to um, you know to go all the way and to do it with a really top-notch uh, legal team so you know please help her do what I did and uh, take, keep, hold Open University accountable. Um, and then the second person I want to talk about is Kathleen Stock. Um, I think we are winning. When this debate comes out into the open, we win because we, we have the rational arguments. But the more we win, the more concentrated pressure is put on, uh, you know, people who, who are standing up. So we saw that with J.K. Rowling, you know, she wrote this essay that was the most careful and compassionate thing. And I think on that day when it came out, we all thought, wow, it's over. Uh, you know, and then the next day, <laughs> all hell broke loose. And, you know, and, and the same thing with Kathleen Stock. She has been the most careful, most compassionate. Um, you know, she, she's not transphobic. She's, she's you know, she is... Um, inclusive of all her students, and she has been vilified. Um, and you know, as Helen Stock says, uh, as Helen Joyce says, 
you know, she's been put in the pillory, that she's been put outside of the village and people are throwing vegetables at her, um, and it's, it's torture. So what I wanted to do was see if we could record a kind of um, We Stand with Kathleen Stock. And so I've got the camera. Um, and so if, if you could all stand up, and we'll come around with the camera. And I think if I'll do one, two, three, and we'll just go, We Stand with Kathleen Stock. Yeah, we'll try it. If it doesn't work the first time, we'll do it again. Ready? Okay. So, one, two, three. We stand with Kathleen Stock! Did that work? Okay, thank you. And then I want to do one more since, like, we're all here. Um, <laughs> so I, you might have seen this came out, like, you know, midnight last night when the papers came out. The Equality and Human Rights Commission, who is the statutory body that looks after the Equality Act and that hasn't been doing its job, and if they had been doing their job, we wouldn't be here. Uh, but they have a new, uh, a new chair, Baroness Kirshwa Faulkner, and she said last night that they are going to issue guidance on single-sex services. So, I, I want to try and do something. I want to try and do something, me to camera that way, and I'll just say um, thank you and good luck, and then if everyone could do a big cheer, and then we'll send it to her. Yeah. <laughs> so, is that going to work? Yeah. When you're ready. Um, this is a message to Baroness Kirsha <laughs> Faulkner, Chair of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. We just want to thank you for standing up and saying that the, the EHRC is going to release guidance on single-sex services. Thank you and good luck. Okay, we can all sit down now. Um, and uh, I hope the rest of my guests have finished their fag breaks and we'll come up and we can um, talk about courage, calling to courage. Oh, oh yes, okay, yeah. Okay. Um, so this is kind of part of my chain reaction, I think, or a chain that I'm a part of. Um, and Jenny was really the first person in that chain for me. It was reading your article in the Sunday Times. It was the Sunday Times, wasn't it? It the, was. It was the, the Sunday, Sunday Times. Times. Um, in 2017, um, that it was kind of the first time I'd really thought about this, and I read this article and I thought, well, oh, that sounds perfectly sensible. Um, and, you know, I just didn't think anything of it and then and then all hell broke loose um and all hell did <laughs> break loose yes um i i was turfed immediately um and threatened <laughs> threatened with death and all kinds of things um and it it did feel surprising that people were actually threatening to kill me. I, yeah, I, mean, I very occasionally I came out of Broadcasting House kind of looking around <laughs> thinking, Where, where's the gunman? Oh, woman. Um, and <laughs> it's really scary, actually. I didn't think I was the sort to be scared. You know, I've been in this business for a very long time and I've said controversial things before. 
Um, but nothing quite as controversial as that one. No one had ever threatened to murder me before and, that. And did you see it coming? I mean, had you kind of well, war games? Well, several of my sensible friends had said, I wouldn't go there if I were you. And I just said, don't be ridiculous. You know, this is a democracy. We have freedom of speech. <laughs> it's perfectly all right for me to say that a trans woman is a trans woman, not a woman. Because the, f the first time I encountered it, and I wish I could remember her name, um, which I can't, she was a vicar. And she transitioned immediately after the Church of England told women they could be ordained. And so, off I went to interview this person, um, and I said, you must be so grateful to all those women who've worked so hard to give you the opportunity to continue to be a priest when you want to be a woman. <coughs> I got no politics, no understanding of sexual politics, definitely no idea what the word feminism meant, and all I got back was, oh, you know, I really am terribly worried. I wonder which dress I'm going to wear to meet my parishioners. That was it. That was the limit of it. And I think that's the first time I got really, really angry about it. How dare he take... <clears throat> take the privileges that women had fought so long and hard for to be ordained, believing they were called to become priests, and he just yeah. got a frock. And, uh, and that, had it been kind of brewing inside you for a long time that you were going to write about it? You know, a lot of people have talked about this sort of... Um, you know, it takes them a while till they get to the point where they just think, I can't not, not write about well, this. Well, I'd, I'd written about... I used to do a, a column in the Express years ago, um, at the time when the BBC wasn't quite so nervous about <coughs> presenters having opinions if they were not giving them on the programme that they were presenting, which, of course, I never did. Um, but when I got really, really, really cross was... Oh, what's the, sorry, I'm not remembering names today. I did get up at half past five. I did drive down from London. I did get caught in all that horrible traffic. Uh, so I can't remember names. The one who offered to show her cervix on television. Oh, India, India Willoughby. <coughs> India Willoughby, that's the one. And I interviewed her about whether you... you I'm trying to be politically correct according to them. <laughs> Look, they're getting cross with me now for actually... I know, you'll, you'll get cancelled from Billion. I will, yeah. You won't want me anymore, will you, you feminists? You say, she's not a turf at all, she loves them. <laughs> I, I, did, I did want to ask you about that, because in that piece you did say that you're not a turf at all, and you said, um, you said you're not like Jermaine Greer and Julie Bindle and, and Julie Burchill. I've never said that. Uh, sorry, Julie. <laughs> sorry, Julie. No, I, I just, I'm, I'm not having a go. I'm just wondering if since then you've kind of, yeah, whether you've changed your view I about niceness and nastiness. I hate to use that terrible cliché. Some of my best friends are trans women. I mean, that's not strictly true. <laughs> but um, I do know trans women who I like and respect and think, yep, yeah, you know, whatever you want to wear, that's entirely up to you. Just understand what we're on about. Understand where we've come from, how hard we have had to fight. You know, I read in the, was it in the Times or the Telegraph yesterday, three trans women being absolutely firm about yeah. respecting us and our view. And one of them, I think, had actually worn a T-shirt which had 
trans women and men across the chest, which I thought was terribly brave. Um, but, uh, and in the article, you know, I, I interviewed uh, one trans woman who had said in a, a discussion on Women's Art many, many years ago that it was not possible for a man to become a woman. And, and she actually admitted that she found herself in, dis and yes, I will say herself, um, in discussions with women where she knew her masculinity was coming out because she was dominating the conversation and interrupting and doing what blokes do. Um, and I absolutely could not claim that a trans woman could be a woman. And she was in the article as well. Thank goodness for her because... You know, I still get a lot of young women who, who are often the daughters of my friends. And my friends fill me up and say, oh God, I made her read that article six times. <laughs> and she still thinks you're wrong. <laughs> but she'll grow up. She'll be all right. So um, I want to bring in Stephanie because she was kind of the next in, in my chain. And she was in that, in that article in, in 2017, Transgender Trend was... Um, and you said earlier it was fury that made you kind of jump in and also that you didn't realise quite what you were quite what you were jumping into, which was the same with me. I thought I thought I work at Think Tank, I can talk about this, it's not that much of a big deal and it turned out it was, but I, I had some idea. I knew some feminists were writing articles, being commissioned to write articles that were then not published. I, you know, there were things going on. Um, so there was, um, and the silencing was so absolute at that time. So I, ha I, I yeah, I, I did have an idea of what was going on. And when I look back, I think it's really odd that I wanted to be a voice in the media that challenged it because there wasn't one. And at the same time, I felt, I, I, I think I had this idea that I would still remain anonymous and just be this little resource for parents. <laughs> and I, it didn't occur to me that being on the radio and the TV and in the papers would, would make me a target. just didn't occur to me. <laughs> you should have asked me. <laughs> I think there's I something about known. not being very good at planning, which is, can be quite a good thing. You know, if you, if you thought this through... You wouldn't ever speak yeah, up. Yeah, and I and I think that I've kept up that kind of pretense in a way. It's the way that I deal with the bullying and the sort of targeted um, harassment campa campaigns against me that really took off after publishing the school's guidance because I'd done something I really wasn't allowed to do. I think they were absolutely outraged that somebody else could produce some school's guidance. So it really, really started and really kicked off then. And I've always responded by ignoring them because I know it's the most annoying thing. <laughs> and I, I still, you know, when I talk to teachers, so last, on Friday, I was talking to a conference of 50 teachers. And I have to go into all of those things. I'm doing more and more of that kind of work now being invited to speak to schools, to teachers, to child protection agencies. You know, I don't put this out publicly, but it, it's a real shift. And when I go into those things, I have to psych myself up to thinking this is an ordinary subject, up for discussion, that there is freedom of debate around this subject. And I have to get into that state of mind to be able to do it. If I went into these groups thinking, you know, this is so, so toxic, I'm, you know, everybody's going to think I'm a bigot as soon as I start talking, then I wouldn't be able to do it. So I, I try and keep that real kind of naivety that I started off with. <laughs> yes, I, I think that's kind of the only way to do it. And there's sort of a freedom in... in having been cancelled, which I'm not recommending that people jump into, <laughs> but, but kind of once you've, you know, it's like when you get in the sea, you know, it's not so bad once you get in the water. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that there's nothing they can say about you that, that you haven't heard. And Well, the thing is, I know that all over the UK, um, I know that the Transgender Trans Schools Guidance is being used in schools. It's even recommended by some local authorities. And that Stonewall can do nothing about it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, that, 
you know, when I talk about putting small things out into the world that are invisible, that's invisible. But it's going on, and that cheers me. And there is, there is nothing that any of those groups, they can attack me all they want, but they can't do anything about that. <laughs> And you talked about when you first started um, Transgender Trends, and you can hold on to it. For now. It's fine. I'll, I'll tell you when to pass it on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> bossy I, 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 I can be bossy. Um, when you first started Transgender Trend, there was, you know, other parenting blogs, and they would talk about everything. I mean, I, you know, I was on, I've been on Mums Now, I, you know, parenting blogs you know, talk about everything, nappies, in such detail and controversy. Uh, and this topic, there was radio silence. And I think we've seen that in other things. You know, Helen Joyce talks about journalists normally run towards the story and they were all running away from the story. You know, was there something about you that made you run towards it? Well, as soon as I saw these stories in the press, the, the, you know, the first thing... I. Saw, I mean, I, it was just horrifying uh, to me immediately. And, and one of the things was, you know, you got a four-year-old boy insisting that he was a girl. And the advice was to agree with him and say, yes, you are a girl. Well, that's the worst parenting advice I've ever heard. And that was the world I was in. And, and, and because I was, yeah, so I was reading a lot of, of parenting blogs and... There are, the whole parenting advice industry, I mean, it's massive industry, and nobody was speaking about this issue. And, and again, if, you know, if you're in schools and there's, there's some sort of new thing come out, or in parenting if there's any new thing, it's di dissected and discussed and everyone's got their different opinions and th thrashed out. And on this subject, there was radio silence, absolute radio silence, and I still get newsletters from some of the most prominent parenting coaches. I just keep up with them. And they still haven't mentioned it. So I felt, I, write a, I was writing a weekly parenting blog at the time, and I was working with parents and running courses and workshops and, and um, based on communication skills. And I, I just thought, I have a responsibility here. I cannot look myself in the face if I carry on writing fairly humorous light blogs every week and not tackling this issue. So I wrote my first piece um, in 2015, early 2015, called Is My Tra Child Transgender? And I, I, I was really, really scared of putting that blog out on, on my site. I thought I'm going to lose all my few followers that I had. And, um, uh, and that, but actually, I, what I got was um, parents contacting me so grateful that somebody had said something. And that's when I realized that there may, you know, that there may be silence, but it doesn't mean that people are not thinking. No. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. And it, it's really interesting, that point about um, organizations that are still pretending this isn't happening, you know, even after J.K. Rowling and, you know, I mean, and they're, and they're just, because, it, you know, it's like when your friend has a skirt tucked in her knickers or spinach on their teeth and, you, you know, you've left it too long to tell them and it's too embarrassing. <laughs> you know, I, how do they come out now and say, oh, yeah, we did notice this before, but, you know, we were just really scared, but we are, you know, we are a... Um, courageous organization with some integrity it's quite difficult I think now to to kind of wake up and come out of the come out of the darkness um, but I wanted to bring in um, Joanna Cherry who I I don't think she needs introduction. <laughs> um, but I think, from my point of view, I think you're a bit of a late bloomer on this issue. Yeah. I remember, follow I think you followed me on Twitter, and you followed um, Anya Palmer, my barrister, and we used to message each other and go, I got a like from Joanna Cherry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she's going to say something about this soon. And then the first time I remember you, you know, in my consciousness, you really speaking out on this was in the joint um, uh, 
Committee on, on Human Rights when uh, the Twitter um, executive came in to be asked about um, harassment on on uh, on Twitter, and you held up the shut the fuck up turfs, and it, it's brilliant. If you haven't watched it, you should watch it. Um, so I sort of wanted to ask you about what was happening up to that point, and then what happened next. Okay, well, um, what basically happened was for some time I'd been feeling, I'd been noticing what was going on, being horrified by it. Um, noticing the way that for me as a lesbian the gay rights movement seemed to have changed and Stonewall just seemed to have changed completely. I went to Pride in 2016 and I hadn't been to Pride since the 90s and I was shocked at how corporate it was and how all the Stonewall posters were about trans rights and I wasn't really aware of what was going on at the front of the march but I found out uh, later my sympathy was with the lesbians who tried to stop the march. Um, so, so I was aware that there was an issue and I arranged to meet with Kerry Tunks and Karen Ingla Smith and they came to see me at Parliament and they'd already, there'd already been quite a fuss when they came to see some Labour MPs. So my, um, I'm very fortunate in my staff and my chief of staff, Fraser, who's very supportive and a great political advisor, he basically smuggled them up the back stairs in Port Colour's house. <laughs> So they could come and see me and we talked through some of the issues and, and I got, you know, some, a really good briefing from them. And then uh, I had been watching what was happening to Caroline Criado Perez and Helen Lewis on Twitter and the Joint Committee of Human Rights, which I'm a member of, I'm now the deputy chair of it, it's chaired by Harriet Harman. Um, we were having, carrying out an inquiry into online abuse of MPs um, but we had Twitter and Facebook executives up in front of us. So I just basically decided to ask this Twitter executive lots of questions about why Twitter takes down um, tweets when women say something like uh, women don't have penises, state a biological fact. But when at that time people like Caroline and Helen were facing the shut the fuck up turf thing, Twitter wouldn't take that down. Repeated complaints and actually in the run-up to the committee, I'd been tweeting about it, and Twitter did take the tweets down because I was because a member of parliament was making a big fuss about it. But I'd, I'd had a look at the Twitter hateful conduct policy, and Caroline had briefed me very thoroughly on it. And of course, in its hate, in its protected characteristics, it has gender, not sex. So I asked her about this, and ultimately, in the committee's report, and it's a cross-party committee of MPs and peers, in our report, we recommended that Twitter should revise their hateful conduct policy and, and include sex because sex is a protected characteristic and we felt that because it wasn't there, <clears throat> because it wasn't there, it, tw it was, was part of the reason why Twitter weren't taking these uh, uh, threats seriously. I mean, we all know, of course, because it's a bunch of nerds in California with, I don't know, algorithms that basically, you know, don't care about the views of women or women like us. But anyway, um, the backlash from that was really quite extraordinary. Um, and, you know, Fraser, who advises me, had said to me, do you really want to do this? You know, it could, it could really destroy your prospects in the SNP of, of holding a future leadership position. And, it, and I was just like, yeah, I do want to do it. And I couldn't really believe it would be that bad, but of course it was. <laughs> And, and one of the things that happened almost immediately as a result of that committee session was that I received a number of death threats, but there was one in particular which came in response to publicity for one of my constituency surgeries, um, which the Met and the Police Scotland um, took really seriously, and I had to have a police escort to a constituency surgery. Um, and we all know, you know how topical and... Um, <coughs> Significant that is after the, the terrible murder of, of David Amos on, on, on Friday um, and indeed the murder of Joe Cox. So, um, you know, that's uh, how it started for me, and I'm quite, uh, we'd say in Scotland, thrawn, kind of determined and individual, and I just thought, I'm just not going to shop about this. And, um, <laughs> And you know, also, I was really, I was really upset about what was happening in my own political party because, um, you know, the 
The Scottish National Party was founded by intellectuals, poets, and writers, and many women were founders of my party, and these women were artists, folklorists, people who really cared about the culture of their country, and also about debate and discussing ideas. And I hated to see the no debate idea taking hold in my political party, and I still do, and I'm absolutely determined to stay and fight and make sure that we go back to our, intell our intellectual uh, roots and um, get past this heresy. <coughs> and how is it, so I, I came to um, meet Joanna Cherry in Parliament and deliver her one of the uh, 1,200 copies of Helen Joyce's book that we've delivered to every MP, MSP and member of the Welsh Senate. And also to have some champagne on the terrace in Parliament, which was lovely. Um, and when we were sitting... Shh, don't tell anyone. Oh. Scottish nationalists aren't supposed to oh. do that. <laughs> I told you. I did, I did tweet it. Um, <laughs> um, but when we were sitting there, a, a Tory MP came by and she said, oh, she sort of looked both ways and, and she said, I think what you're doing is brilliant. And then she went away. And I, I just wanted to ask you, Hannah, how is it in Parliament? And, you know, what's the... Well, underneath the iceberg look like? I mean, in Parliament, there obviously there's people like uh, Rosie Duffield and Tonya Antonazzi in the Labour Party. And then um, there are people like Jackie Doyle-Price and others in the Conservative Party. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the, uh, no offence to any Lib Dems in the audience, but the Lib Dems are lost to us. Although I, I do sense perhaps there's one or two of the female MPs in the Lib Dems who are that, you know, they're probably in the state I was in a few years ago, worried, you know, thinking what the hell's going on, but not sure whether to speak out or not. Um, so, and then in the Lords, as was discussed in some of the sessions yesterday, there's quite a bit of support. And um, so, you know, there's quite a bit of cross-party support growing and a fair bit of work going on. And, um, you know, I do think the events of last week, not just the murder of Sir David Ames, but also what's ha been happening to Kathleen Stock. I think there's a real head of concern building up amongst politicians from all parties that, um, you know, our, the, the, the nature of our public discourse, you know, the monstering of those with whom we disagree uh, really has to stop. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm quite hopeful as to the future. Um, uh, but, you know, for me, it's been very difficult in my own political party because... I was a front bench spokesperson for since my election in 2015 until February of this year. I was the party's spokesperson on justice and home affairs. And, you know, at the risk of tooting my own trumpet, I'm the only person in the SNP who's actually laid a glove on Boris Johnson because I led the prorogation case. So, but, but you know, d d despite all of that, I was summarily sacked from my front bench position without any real explanation being given, but in the week, in, in the week, you know, everyone knows why, or anyone, anyone who's paying attention knows why, because in, in the week running up to my sacking, I was attacked by a number of leading politicians in my party who basically accused me of transphobia. And I think those people put a target on my back. And the day, the day I was sacked, I received a, a threat of rape from a man who turned out to be a member of the SNP. Jesus who went to court and was convicted and, let me tell you, has a history of knife crime. He has a previous conviction for carrying a knife. And not one single elected parliamentarian in my party has publicly acknowledged what happened or condemned the fact that a man threatened me with rape, a man with a history of knife crime, and has been convicted of it. So that's how, that's how bad things are. That's how bad things are. But that's the public face of it. Many, many members of my party are deeply, deeply concerned about this. And of course, the SNP was one of the first parties that had the SNP Women's Pledge. Unfortunately, a lot of the women who've signed that pledge have left my party. Some have left politics altogether and some have joined ALBA, which is a, a breakaway party from the SNP. But my very firm view is that I will stay where I am. I mean, there's a number of reasons to do why I would do that. Um, Anyway, because, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a constitutional nationalist and I think the best way to persuade people, um, I think the SNP, 
is the best way to persuade people to, to vote for independence in Scotland rather than uh, any other party. But also, I think it's really important that when that what happens to women like us is that when we speak up, uh, people try to bully and silence us into intimidation, uh, intimidate us into silence. And the thing that many people would most like for me to do is to leave politics and leave the SNP, and I'm absolutely not going to do that. And, and you know, I, ha I have had to give it some quite serious thought because the, you know, the, I've been to, you know, two men have been convicted of making threats against me in Scotland. Um, and the first one was at a constituency surgery. That's a whole different story and wasn't connected to this issue. But, you know, I've had to deal with a lot of death threats and I've had very little support from my own party because, because I'm a turf as far as they're concerned. Um, uh, and I thought very long and hard this year about leaving politics because I had a really good career before I went into politics. You know, I could go back because I was a barrister and an advocate in Scotland. I could go back to the bar and, and, and get on with that. But, um, you know, it's just really partly, I've really been thinking about it the last week because I was coming to this conference and, and next week I'm speaking at the LGB Alliance. But I think also... Um, it, 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 also, in the light of, of the terrible killing of Sir David Ames, you know, Conservatives aren't really my cup of tea, but he was a very decent man and a man of faith. And, you know, many people of faith don't really live their faith, but I think he actually did, and I admired him for that. And um, he... Uh, I, I, I think that's really helped me come to the conclusion that I'm absolutely determined not to be bullied out of what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm really in for the long haul and in for the fight. Brilliant. Good. Thank you, thank you. Um, and so I want to talk to Vaishnavi and then to, to Leisha as well. Um, you know, I think the three of us have had, um, have had to be brave, but we're also amongst, you know, kind of a critical mass. And I think it seems to be something in the water on, on Turf Island that, that <laughs> is, you know, that is happening here that makes it somewhat, somewhat easier. Um, but um, I think I'll go to, to Leisha first. So Leisha set up uh, the campaign called um, The Countess Didn't Fight For This in Ireland. And, you know, the situation in Ireland, I think, is that, um, you know, it's, it, it's a much smaller country. It wanted to prove its credentials as being um, at the forefront of human rights, and it just swallowed the gender ideology in one in one gulp before anyone had a chance to to organize against it and so it feels like a much harder situation that, than we're in um and yeah Lee should kind of tell us how you're doing it and what you're doing um so i um i actually had the same entry point as joanna um i remember uh, can you hear me yeah, yeah. I remember uh, so well that um, I was living in London at the time and I remember that uh, Pride 2018, I think, and um, I didn't really understand the issues. I probably had a kind of subconscious disquiet, but you know, I had a small baby and life is busy. But I will never forget that day because I remember um, it was a really, to me, a kind of visual and visceral juxtaposition of these women with their cardboard signs, you know, doing a really peaceful action, lying down on the ground before the parade, and then the cameras panning to just a sea of, like, just vapid, hedonistic, yeah. quite corporate, corporate banners everywhere, Goldman Sachs, all the banks, all, and um, something just jarred, something, it just caught in my claw, and I couldn't really uh, stop thinking about it. And then what amplified it further was uh, Sadiq Khan, essentially reading out a Stonewall written press release, he said, there is no place for hate in London Pride. And I remember thinking again, it jarred so much for me. I was like, hate? That wasn't hate, they lay down on the ground. I mean, it's like, it's Gandhi-esque. I mean, how is that hate? But I felt there was just such a scary Orwellian kind of um, double speak happening. And so I consciously went down the rabbit hole um, 
I remember the sign said the cotton ceiling is rape culture. I had no idea what that meant, but that was my entry point. So thank you to those lesbians who actually <laughs> did that action. And so I consciously, you know, started reading, reading, reading. I've always had that personality. I, I now see, and it's kind of helped me in my work. I think there is a personality type that becomes an activist. I feel like we are the people who cannot compartmentalize. We can't just forget about things. You know, if we could, we'd just get on with our lives. But I feel like we do share that tendency in common, which is, you know, you need to try to get a handle on something and then you have to do something about it. And, and it's also a sense of having a lot of empathy, you know, like hopefully I'll never end up in, a, in Limerick, in the late, you know, the women's wing of, of um, Limerick prison in Ireland where men are being locked up with women. But I worry about those women. It's kept me awake at night. And I think that is what we share. That's our commonality. But in terms of my own story, so I, um, found all these amazing thought leaders in the UK on Twitter. Like, you know, I, I, I'm not going to try and list them all, but I mean, I owe a huge debt to those women who set, who created, who built the framework of the argument of the resistance. And that's where this has come from. This is the crucible of that theoretical framework, and I owe all those women such a debt. But then what happened was, I started talking about it. I couldn't stop talking about it. I mean, I was boring people. I was <laughs> sort of, I just really, like, I, I suppose I had grasped the existential threat. So, so when, I, when I understood it finally, and I kind of came to, came up for air, it felt like I'd come out of a bunker, and I was in this dystopian kind of like world, and, but, but the people didn't know, and I had to tell the people. But so I was just <laughs> telling people all the time. And, and I, there was some like fairly feisty, you know, gatherings in London, I was still in London, and you know, uh, meetings, dinner parties, and people would have strong opinions on both sides, but we were able to talk about it. I think that's what Maya is referring to, like it's a different time on the timeline, and you know, there's cultural differences. So then what happened was I had a dinner in Dublin, and, and these were close family friends. They were actually the godparents of my daughter. So you know, it's very close friends. And I did the same thing, I brought it up, and everyone looked at the table in silence. They just, there was just a kind of, you know, the shutters went down, fear, and they just sort of froze almost. And I froze internally, I felt it just a chill, and I just thought, I have to do something. It's not okay in a democratic country that people are afraid to even proffer an opinion about this. So um, we were actually relocating anyway to Dublin from London, so I kind of brought forward that date. And, and yeah, I started organizing on Twitter, and at the early stages it was very difficult. People were so cowed and scared um, in Ireland, it was almost hard to find if someone was based in Ireland physically. And for that reason, we've lots of uh, Irish women based in different European countries, because I just thought they were based in Ireland. <laughs> Nowadays, largely because of our work, people will have an Irish uh, flag, and they'll have their names increasingly, because they're less afraid, they're less cowed. But, so uh, we launched a year ago, um, after lots and lots of Zooms, and lots of storming and norming. Um, but I suppose if I wanted to um, give anyone a takeaway, um, like I have no background, I'm not an academic feminist, I have no background in activism, I'd never done any activism. Now I would say I had that personality type, like I cannot let go of things, and I have that, you know, um, there's been lots of issues in my life that I've got really, really into and um, enraged by and, you know, exercised by emotionally. But this was the one that I thought, I have three daughters. This, ha this is the fight of my life. You know, I, there is nothing else. Um, yeah, so I would say, yeah, in terms of the, uh, us being uh, activists, I think that we are the truth tellers to the culture, and we need to remember that, and we need to look after ourselves, you know, because, like, they, in Ireland as well, what I've realized is, like, some people have taken this on like a religious belief. Yeah. And so, but, and so they are the hardest ones to win over, and so with those people, and I've learned so much from the British activists, like, I will, 
just talk about the system, this practice, this policy, you know, just keep it really kind of dry. And that is, has really helped us. Um, and, but what I've realized as well in the, in the last year is, like, when it feels like it's such a hard slog, you know, and you're getting targeted personally, and it feels like you're putting out all this work, you're doing all this brain work, and you're getting tumbleweed, you know, from the media, from the politicians. What I now know after a year post-launch, they're always watching you. They're watching you. They want to see, you know, are you disciplined? What is your messaging? Are you fair? Is it safe for them? Um, and like, it took us five months, and I mean, it seemed overnight that these things do, but like, it was like we were sending out press releases, we were doing this great brain work, we were organizing, you know, working groups and all the different issues, because we're still, we're, you know, unlike here where there's specialist groups really for different areas, we do all the areas. We've got eight pillars of concern, <laughs> it's quite a lot. But um, what, what, I, what I now know in retrospect was, I, because my background is, um, I'm a journalist, and from the very beginning, we, we did a lot of working up on what we were going to say. Would we say trans women? You know, would we be brave and say men? Would we, like, how would we? And, the, and, and also that has, uh, has shifted and changed over time. I now talk about men who identify as women. Um, I recently... <laughs> um, I recently uh, had to do a speech. I'm training to be a barrister and... Um, I thought I'm going to, we were asked to do a three minute presentation on something we knew something about already, just stand up and talk. And I thought, well, I have to do it on this. But I did three and a half minutes without mentioning trans once. So I'm going to use their language like they use language. You know, I'm going to, like I'm going to, but um, going back to my point about you're always being watched. Um, so it took us five months for, to sort of cr crack the mainstream media monolith, I would say. And then we ended up our campaign to preserve single-sex toilets in schools in Ireland, which Tenny, which is the Irish Stonewall, have basically uh, lobbied to for the uh, and successfully lobbied because the Irish Department of Education are about to remove all single-sex toilets across every school in Ireland. And our campaign got the front page of the Irish Times, and we were quoted. And that's the thing: once you're a credible source in the mainstream media, because. This is the home crowd, and we do lots of webinars, and it's the home crowd, but it's the people beyond the sort of GC or the feminists who, who we need to reach, because their votes count too. So th that was a very a much a milestone. And then, more recently, the tabloids picked up our, one, another campaign about the indoctrination of school children. They were being asked to pledge allegiance to gender identity ideology in Irish schools. So like this thing has got its tendrils into every aspect of Irish life and public sector. But equally, we are, we are, like, I feel like I've been pushing a big boulder up a hill and now we're on the flat. You know, it feels like that. And I'm pleased to say as well, um, it, that took five months to kind of get, you know, get traction in the media and to be seen as a credible source. And then a seven more months, including the poll that we ran, um, now I'm pleased to say we have some political traction. I've had a meeting in the Oireachtas with a senator who's going to do order of businesses for us on all the issues. I'm meeting our first ever, the first ever meeting with the TD, which is an MP, is happening next week. So, you know, it, it is paying off. Um, I, yeah. I think... Keep going yeah. I think the, the thing I see in your campaign and, you know, also obviously in tra transgender trends is this thing about, um, you know, that kind of discipline and putting the work in and, and, you know, you put it out there and eventually you get some traction um, and, you know, just kind of keeping on with it and, as you say, they're watching. Um, Vaishnavi, I want to bring you in as well. Um, so, um, before you made dysphoric, you made, um, but what was she wearing? And you were cancelled as a turf for that. Did you know you were a turf at that point? <laughs> I was just tweeting in my personal Twitter account and uh, somebody who wanted to screen the film um, dug up old tweets, really, and decided that she's not one of us. Therefore, we must cancel anything that she has done, even if the film that they intended to screen in the beginning represented all the women that they claimed to represent. So by cancelling me, they've cancelled pretty much all the women of India. And this is one of those diaspora organizations in the US, right? 
It was such an irony because the founder is an Indian woman and she met me while she was in India. I, I assume by then she hadn't seen my Twitter. Um, then agreed to do it, later decided that it was not good enough because I, um, it was a rather, that's how it happens all the time to all of us, isn't it? It just suddenly hits you. Ha have I been cancelled? What is this email? Is this what it is? Is this what all these amazing women on Twitter talk about? Is this how it feels? It was a very, very cold, um, hurtful email that said, with links and everything, that these don't align with their whatever. No explanation, no opportunity to explain myself, nothing. Just said, we decided, therefore we cancel it. And I had gone all the way to the US for another program, but the fact that they could have had me, we could have discussed the issues, perhaps there were opportunities that could have been had with the audience, you know, Indian women living abroad, who are, you know, affluent, who could pull some strings back for, you know, women in India, anything, anything was possible. And I work exclusively with women. Maybe the filmmakers in my uh, documentary could have had opportunities there, anything. But they just blatantly um, stopped it. I thought about writing about it for many, many days. The words just weren't there. What do you say to such stupidity? <laughs> what? Oh, oh, we saw your tweets and we don't want to screen your film. Okay. And did they, did they give you a, I mean, I, I've kind of thought, I've got obviously, you know, because I'm going back to court, you know, I've looked at all of my tweets and um, tried to work out what it is that I was cancelled for. And, I, and, and basically what I think it was, was not apologising. You know, you have to apologise and apologise and apologise. And because I didn't apologise, I think that that's what it was. It wasn't anything that I'd originally said. Did they did they want you to, if you'd have apologised at that point, was that an offer on the table? Yeah, they definitely would have liked that I capitulate and you know bow down to their penis overlords. But <laughs> I, <laughs> but I but I wouldn't. I mean, if. I, I was pretty aware by then uh, what's going on with the whole gender thing. But surrendering to them, I don't know, I can't live with myself then. Uh, I, I, it's not possible, that thought didn't even cross my mind. No apology, that, that was it. In fact, the email made me angrier. Yeah. And yeah. I wanted to just get on with being a far more incredible turf. <laughs> because I wanted to show them how dare you how dare you silence a woman who's talking about women because you think men are now women that's not acceptable at all and then that led on led to you know all the other cancellations the little things friends mm -hmm. not talking to you calling you horrible names Instagram messages periodically telling me how I'm a whore, I'm, I'm a feminist whore. <laughs> Different things, they get creative. But that keeps happening all the time now. Now I'm just very desensitized. I don't really care about all these things. Just get on with the work yeah. because it's important. There's an urgency. Yeah. Nobody's realizing that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I was going to ask you, but you said it anyway, that is your feeling that this is coming from international, you know, um, diaspora or international organizations, you know, the, the sort of um, push against being a turf in India seems like we wouldn't expect it. Has it come from international organizations? Yeah, definitely. They're all watching what's going on in the US and the UK. They're all mimicking the exact same inclusion nonsense. And they're also mimicking the exact same abuse strategy towards turfs. Indian social media users are saying the exact same things um, the trolls abroad are saying because they're watching them. So they have to stand in line with them in order for them to be accepted as one of them. So if you get um, shut the fuck up turf, I get it too. It's literally the same mm -hmm. thing. It, it's weird, but that's true. And that is what motivated me to make dysphoric actually, because if, uh, 
they are able to mimic the abuse and they are able to mimic this whole gender thing, I'm non-binary and everything and I'm wondering how many of them are interested in actually changing their body too. Yeah. And that research, you know, led me to this rabbit hole and now we have a film. Yeah. I won't do it again but we have it. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's brilliant, you should, everyone should watch the film. And, and is it sort of, I, you know, quite often I see these things on social media, you know, viral, um, maybe it does just come through social media, but does it also come through, you know, multinational corporations and, and sort of career structures and um, international development funding or the UN or, you know, or is it really just organic through people being nasty on Twitter and learning other ways of being nasty on Twitter? No, it's coming from everywhere. Um, after biting dust in the UK, Stonewall has collaborated with an Indian organization doing some form of a workplace equality and inclusion project. I really don't understand how does it matter to my workplace if I'm, a, if I'm what my sexuality is, who I'm sleeping with. But this project is exclusively designed in a way that it only helps trans identifying men. Because who else is going to benefit from this project? And the, the names, the who's who of Indian industrialists, billionaires, are all there as supporters. So it's very clear that they're just following the money. But Stonewall entering into a country like mine, which already has, I don't know, you, you name a problem, we have it. That I thought was just, just wrong. It's, it's perverse that they dare to enter a country like mine, which already is suffering from so many horrible things. I can't um, make people realize that this is so dangerous, more than I'm already doing, but there are no listeners. People don't seem to understand what it means for Stonewall to collaborate with an Indian multi-billionaire organization. They do not see the danger in that. But when I sound the alarm, they can't seem to make that connection. At the moment, it just seems like some sort of a, what do you call that, a conspiracy theorist. Mm. Yeah. They look at you as if you're deluded. But the time will come. It, unfortunately, it has to come. We are bust, maybe just catching up with all of you. In five to seven years, things are going to get really horrible over there. Um, uh, John, John Hopkins has set up a trans clinic in Hyderabad. Why? Mm. Why? You know, they say Section 377, which was supposed to be about uh, homosexuality, was only recently deemed unconstitutional, so you can't penalize people for being homosexual. That was in 2018. Gay marriage is still not legal because they think it is unnatural. Is it natural to chop your breasts off? They're setting up trans yeah. clinics in every city. And I'm afraid, I'm really terrified of this because women in India have a million reasons more to flee womanhood. Yeah. But I'm just like, you know, you just keep talking and hope that somebody listens at some point. I guess that's all you can do at the moment. Yeah. And what, what keeps you going? I don't know what else to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, um, I kind of wanted to come back to all of you and ask you advice, um, <laughs> <laughs> not to me, but you know, kind of having gone through this, what have you learned, what advice would you give to other people, what advice would you give to yourself um, if you were doing it again, uh, starting again? Joanna has made me feel slightly ashamed, I have to say. Uh, she's not quitting, I quit. Because what happened at the BBC is, I did that interview with the cervix person, um, <laughs> whose name I simply can't speak. Um, and then I wrote the article. And, you know, I had done that program for 33 years. I had never, is cocked up an appropriate word? Probably not. <laughs> um, you know, I'd never been perceived as someone who couldn't be trusted. Uh, and suddenly I had a manager coming into my office saying, oh God, Jenny, oh God, oh God, oh, have you seen all the shoutings on, on Twitter? You know, I, I don't think we can let you discuss this question anymore. That's what happened. They didn't want to cancel me. They didn't want to sack me. In fact, the big boss, when oh, three years later, 
I went and said, look, I've decided to quit because I thought I can't work in this atmosphere. I can't do what I love doing in this not being trusted sense. And I made the excuse that I was approaching my 70th birthday. I know, I'm 71 now. You, you are <laughs> astonished, aren't you? <clears throat> but I made that excuse, you know, I've done it for 33 years. I've, I'm coming up to my 70th birthday. I'll do it until October and then I'm off because, I, you know, I need to do something different. That was bullshit. I did not want to leave Woman's Earth. I loved it. I absolutely loved it but I couldn't stay in that atmosphere. I couldn't stay in that atmosphere. And Cherry, I should have. <laughs> I mean, it's, it still freaks me out that your voice is not on Women's Hour when I switch it on, because it was so much part of you. But, it freaks you know, me you, out too. <laughs> but, I would say that you haven't really quit because you're here um, and you're speaking and I, out. I do. A... It's very interesting. Uh, in fact, uh, Suzanne Moore said recently, isn't it interesting that all those of us who are on this side are now writing for right-wing newspapers because the others won't have us. She writes for the Telegraph. I write for the Daily Mail. Oh, excuse me, this cold is just driving me mad. You're all in the same stage, aren't you? Um, but as long as I can get the message out there, I, I don't care. I just want to get the message out and keep it out. And I, will, I will carry on with the advice thing, but can I um, also ask about another institution that you left, Fawcett, which... Um, uh, his, I, yeah, I don't even know. Well, I was it's their conference this for weekend. For many years, the president of Fawcett, and over this issue, I quit. Yeah. And I will say no more. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll say. Can I say? Yeah, go on. You say, <laughs> say what you like, I darling. Mean, <laughs> it, it's their conference this weekend, and. I don't think anybody's there. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, and all of the speakers have pronouns in their bios. Oh. And, you know, this session is called Courage Calls to Courage. <laughs> I, I think, you know, there are some organisations that we will need to turn around. And, you know, I hope we can turn around some of the big beasts like the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And there are some organisations that I think have decided to die. And I think Fawcett have decided to die. I, you know, I, I hope they haven't. Uh, but because Sam was a brilliant chief executive and she left at around the same time as I did. It's, it's very, very sad. Yes, it because is. Because it had done really good work, really good research. You know, when I was working on Women's Hour, an awful lot of our background research was, was from Fawcett. They were excellent political researchers. And we're... Losing that. And, and, I, and I think the thing that makes me so disappointed about Fawcett, I think they, they saw this issue and they said, it's not our issue and we can see that it's toxic and difficult and if we pick it up, it's going to um, undermine everything else that we're doing and what else we're doing is important. It's about women's rights, it's about women in the workplace, it's about women in politics. But this is about women in the workplace and this is about women in politics. And I, you know, I think the, the crux of this comes back to the workplace. You know, if they can take away your livelihood, take away your career, take, you know, make your house, your pension, you know, your, your ability to live and support yourself and your children, then, then they've taken away your voice. And, you know, so force it to do all this stuff about gender pay gap and this kind of formal stuff about women in the workplace. But this is targeting women in the workplace and making them afraid um, and, and forcing them out of jobs, making them unable to do their jobs and unable to be in parliament and, and they can't see it and they've, yeah, I think they've left the stage. So here we are, this is the stage. But, um. <laughs> uh, 
advice to your younger self or other selves, Joanna? Advice um, to my younger self when I first got involved in this um, and advice to others. Well, I think, I think, the, I think the point that um, thinking very carefully about how you approach use of language and how, how you approach people in order to gather mainstream support is probably very good advice. Um, but the advice I would generally give to people is that I, I do think the tide is, change, is turning and that there's hope. You know, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, that's big. And, and I can tell you, when Baroness Falker, Faulkner was first appointed, there's a, like a sort of confirmation hearing where the Joint Committee of Human Rights and the Women's Committee, Women's Select Committee of the House of Commons got to ask her questions. And I asked her a lot of really hard questions about this issue. And she clearly went away and thought about them. You can imagine the questions she was getting from some people on the Women Equalities Committee, uh, which would have been very diametrically opposed to our view of things. But she clearly went away and thought about it. And she's taking a stand. Um, so you know, and what's happening with institutions withdrawing from Stonewall because of their advice, which misrepresents the law, that's very important. Um, you know, we have case law, we have Maya's fantastic victory, which means that for people like me now, you know, th there are people in my political party who want to destroy me, get me out of my party, and prevent and destroy my reputation so I can't go back to the bar and practice. But it's going to be very hard for them to do that now because they cannot discriminate, discriminate against me on the grounds of my gender critical beliefs. And if they do, <laughs> you know, clearly they already have done so. But if they try to deselect me or kick me out, then thanks to Maya, I've got a pretty strong argument. Yeah. Um, and. And you know that there, there's other litigation uh, pending, which could be uh, very important. So we have case law, we have literature. You know, we have these fantastic three fantastic books published recently: Helen Joyce's book, Kathleen Stock's book, Julie Bindle's book. You know, and, and those are you know those books are selling well. You know, they're reaching beyond the mainstream. You know, my 84-year-old dad is reading Helen Joyce's book. <laughs> He also says that he, he now self-identifies as a penguin as well. But, <laughs> but um, you know, but, so th you know, it's reaching beyond those who are already um, convinced. And I do think there are a lot of women and men in political parties and the public sphere who, who picked up this idea and ran with it because it was the, late at the, ne you know, the next great frontier in human rights before they realised its full implications actually a deeply irresponsible thing for any politician to do, but that's what's happened. And I think many of these women and men are now in a very difficult position where they moved an inch, they move an inch, they'll be called transphobic and cancelled like some of us have been. And so in a sense, we have to try to find a way to reach out to them, painful as it might be for some of us who've been thoroughly uh, attacked by these people, we still have to find a way to try and give them some sort of bridge back to a more um, reasonable uh, position. Um, but I actually think, and I probably would say this because I'm a lawyer to trade, but I actually think the law is going to be a very important weapon here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Use the law. Yeah, yeah I, I um, totally agree there about uh, the law and also just that space because I've started uh, talking to trainee barristers about this and um, these are 22 year olds and I've always felt that generation was the hardest to get through to but within that space they, they were able to say look I, I disagree with you but I would fight for the, your right to say this and I thought wow if that's what the future generation of barristers feel then there is hope actually for that particular demographic especially um, and what also struck me when I was having this conversation um, this uh, guy who was 22, I said, oh, sure, you were probably born in 90, like 1990, were you? And he said, no, 1998. <laughs> <laughs> and I just had that thing where you're like, I, I felt, wow. He said, I've known nothing else. I've never heard your view put across ever. 
I've known nothing else other than the politicians and the media saying one thing, what he meant was the trans orthodoxy, because in Ireland, obviously, it was brought in in 2015, when he was seven. Like that is the thing to get across. They have come up through it. It is totally normative. It's the sea they're swimming in. Yeah. Um, and also, it's sometimes when I hear about the amazing um, test case and landmark cases, and you know, it feels like in England, um, here in the UK, like they're falling one by one. It's a domino effect. All your um, August institutions, and I do sometimes think, oh, things are so bad in Ireland. <laughs> like, for instance, our equivalent of the faucet is the National Women's Council of Ireland. They wrote a letter asking for me and my group that I, that I built to be disenfranchised. Mm. They have elected a father of four onto their board. Oh. This is what we are facing in Ireland. But likewise, they put all this great work out about gender pay gaps and quotas and boards. And you're like, but you've elected a man who's a father of four onto your board as a woman. So it all means nothing. But I would say in terms of advice to activists and to, um, you know, I got shingles three times in the first 18 months. I was doing 18 hour days. Um, and I think in a way I don't regret that. I had to birth this organization and I had to organize it. But I would say they're going back to being the, the truth teller to the culture. The culture doesn't understand, doesn't know, maybe is too busy, thinks you're transphobic, hateful. There is a cognitive dissonance there, and that is an emotional load, and I think we should all acknowledge that. And we need to look after ourselves because of that, because there, there is a cognitive dissonance, and we do all carry that, and we internalize that. And I think um, it's important to um, always be mindful of that. Um, but yeah, ultimately, even though things are much worse in Ireland, I'm an optimist, and I would say to anyone organizing, hold true to your vision. You know, it's really hard to get a group off the ground, and there's lots of storming and norming, but ultimately, people self-select after a while. If you keep going, and you do it this way, and you're nice to everyone, people then, you know, initially it's, it can be rough, but then eventually you get a good team, and you know, now we have a really lovely, there's about 30 women in the core group, um, and then lots of other kind of armchair activists, but yeah, I think stay true to your vision and keep going. You know, we can do this, we can do this. Okay, a couple of things. Um, people have asked me before, what's your advice on setting up an organisation? And I've always said, don't do it the way I did. Um, <laughs> get yourself a team, get yourself a, you know, you, you need a lawyer, you need a social media person, you need a teacher, you need, you need a, 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 a scientist, you know, get people with skills around you. But, um, but you know, hey, I didn't do that and, 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 and I've achieved success. So I, I think you do it in your own way, actually. Um, at that time, there wasn't a team. There wasn't, there wasn't that option. Um, I, w I, w I would say everybody's different, but I, I really do think women have to look after themselves and do it in their own way, um, according to your personality and what you are, the capacity you have um, in what you can do. I'd say as, um, as women, we have enormous power in talking to children. And that the advice I would give to parents is to use that, to, uh, to, use it, to use the power of being a parent in your schools. If you feel you can't state your opinion, um, ask a question. Always ask a question. Um, and the same with your children. You know with teenage kids, when they have been brought up with this, they're, they're at the age where they're not going to listen to you, they're going to listen to their peer group. But again, ask the question, state your beliefs, be quite cool about it, don't try and win an argument. Um, that's not the point. The point is planting a seed. You ask a question that they can't answer and that will be going around in their heads. So, just, so, so don't give up whatever your children profess they believe. Keep to your truth and speak your truth, um, but you know, don't lecture them or go on about it. And, and that will make change. And I think, and I do believe in change happening in those really little, or supposedly little ways invisibly. I think it amounts to a huge yeah. change. Thank you. Um, um, I, th I think um, as, as 
the positivity that's in this room, it's great. I would love to just take it in a bottle and keep it with me whenever I feel uh, low. But the challenge about tackling uh, the gender situation in India is, is, is complicated because in law, as it should be, words have meaning. And aside from definition of a woman which is in jeopardy right now, in India we speak multiple languages. We do not have separate words for gender and sex. Earlier, it just meant sex. And now because there is no two dis distinct um, words, they are using that to their advantage. So in law, people are using sex as gender, gender identity as gender, therefore, gender is sex, you know, some sort of a weird twisted amalgamation of these uh, complicated terminologies. The challenge about taking it on with politicians is also complicated because my constituency MP, she's a woman, and I was extremely thrilled that she's a woman, writes a really long essay in the national newspaper read by almost every Indian about how sex, sex work is work. I was all set to meet her and then she writes this article and I was so disheartened. I have to gather the courage and arguments to approach this woman, but I will eventually. I suppose my, not advice, but I suggest that in some way possible in a day, you know, maybe a tweet or maybe a, a conversation with a friend or with your family, just keep having that, keep doing that, have that quota checked for your everyday things to do and do this consciously, um, write it on your notebook or have a reminder on your laptop, do, do something about this at least once every day for the rest of your life. Thank you. So, yeah, it's not okay, don't shut up, keep talking about it. And can can I just make one other suggestion? Go on. Send a letter to Robert Winston saying, good man. Yes. They do exist. And he was all over the papers. So, um, I don't know if she heard us in Sussex, Kathleen Stock, um, but we have a message from her. So I messaged her earlier, actually just before we did that, and uh, I said to her, sending you the love of a thousand women here in Philia. And she replied saying she's, she's had a tough time. Uh, no one who has done anything for the cause should feel any worries on my behalf. I am well supported and I'm not going to shut up. Yeah. Thanks, Helen. Um, yeah, don't shut up. Um, so can I have one more round of applause for the brilliant panel? Can we run the video? Thank you.